Hello and good morning. Welcome to Study the Word. This program is sponsored by the Kirk, Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at 948 South Geyer Road, right there in Kirkwood, at the corner of Big Ben and Geyer Road. We'd love to have you come and be with us, folks. You see our website, gives you your, the, uh, the location if you're not familiar with the area, directions, and of course our times of services. We upload past TV programs, so you can go to that website, jot it down. You can look at it at other times of all our past TV programs dealing with Bible questions and Bible answers. And we'd love for you to participate. You see that phone number? Call or text your question. We will deal with it on this program. We say almost every week, Bible questions deserve Bible answers. And what we mean by that is we don't want to give you some church doctrine. We don't want to give you the... Um, the uh, ideas from the mind of man. We want what God says on these matters. And in just a few moments, we're going to be dealing with a very, very important question um, dealing with the book of Revelation. So I hope you'll stay tuned for that. At the end of the program, we have all those many useful free Bible study helps that we hope that you will take advantage of, as so many in the area have, and uh, you can uh, request them. So let's go ahead and jump into our program today on the book of Revelation. Had a call recently. Nice gentleman gave me a call. We've talked in the past. I always like to talk about the Bible with folks. And uh, it was interesting that he wanted me to give my opinion about the latter books or the latter chapters of the book of Revelation and saying that isn't that talking about the uh, United States? Folks, if there's ever a book that is being abused by people today and creating so much confusion and having people believe things that are just not true, it would have to be the book of Revelation. And why is that? Well, if you haven't read the book, it's full of highly symbolic figurative language. And it was written that way for a purpose. Because three times in the book of Revelation, twice in the first three verses, and then near the end in the 22nd chapter in verse 6, it's talking about the things that will shortly come to pass. This was written to Christians, all right, in the first century who were about to endure some terrible persecutions at the hand of the Roman Empire. Terrible things. Secular history will confirm that. They were given words that would encourage them to remain true to the very end. And so a lot of the book deals with a spiritual battle against evil and how that our Lord provides victory and how that the brethren were told, be faithful until death and heaven will be yours. Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 10. And that message has not changed throughout time. And so for you and I, we need to keep in mind that when you read the scriptures from the book of Genesis to the very end, we need to understand that there is a theme to the, to the Bible, and that is a scheme of redemption, a plan that God had in mind before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. God had a plan. Man, if man sinned, the plan started to unfold. And that plan was that Jesus Christ would ultimately come. There's so many prophecies about that, even way back there in Genesis chapter 3. And you can read about it in Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses. Abraham, given that seed promise, someone would come through from his lineage through, through Abraham that you read about in Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 29. If you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That promise way back there in the book of Genesis. Now, I'm very passionate about today's lesson because I really want you folks to listen carefully to what we're talking about. Now, the people that don't want to listen, you're not going to help them. People that don't want to think, you can't, you can't reason with them. People will believe whatever they want. I know that's true. People will believe whatever they want to believe. We're just trying to get people to believe what God has said. And when it comes to the scriptures, so many people are handling it the very way that Peter warned about. I'm going to read this in 2 Peter, okay? 2 Peter chapter 3. When it comes to the scriptures, 
It says in verse 16, as in also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things, of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. They're twisting the scriptures. And how they're twisting it is like this. And this is what I just want people to think. Why would the Lord, our God, provide his inspired word, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Why would our God provide all these scriptures that you have in the Bible? Okay. You go all the way through. Everything's in harmony. They're pointing to the same thing, pointing to Jesus that would ultimately come. And then you get to the book of Revelation, and all of a sudden he just changes his direction, changes his teaching that contradicts everything else that he had talked about in Scripture. Well, he wouldn't do that. But that's exactly what people are doing with the book of Revelation. People are talking about things that, that does not make sense. Oh, it makes sense if you just stay within the book of Revelation and twist things and manipulate passages to teach what you want. But if you're going to try to harmonize the book of Revelation with the rest of the Scriptures, you can't believe what these people are trying to tell you. Now, how can I make this easy to understand in the short time we have together this morning? Okay, here's what I'm wanting us to see. I'm going to go to the book of Hebrews quickly for a moment in the ninth chapter. Hebrews chapter 9. And this chapter is dealing with Jesus, as most of the book is, showing the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, how Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And he mentions something like this in verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 9. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Listen to this, verse 15. And for this reason, he, talking about Jesus, is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of Redemption. Who needs to be redeemed? For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. So Jesus is going to redeem those people that were under the old law, the law of Moses. And that those who are called might receive the promise of the internal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. So Jesus comes. And he's going to be pro providing a new testament, a new law for all people. Really? For all people. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15 was, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now the people who mishandle the book of Revelation who are religious, they will agree with that. Yeah, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But they're not thinking it through. What do I mean? Well. Paul mentioned in this idea of preaching this message in Romans, the first chapter, the reason, of course, why we preach the gospel, because he says in verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation. Let's not stop there, because he says, for everyone who believes, for everyone, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There's no distinction. I'm wanting us to see that when Jesus came and Jesus died and brought a New Testament, Galatians chapter 3 tells us that there is no distinction that needs to be made between anyone. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter it, what race you are. Because he says here in Galatians chapter 3, he says in verse 27, for as many of you that were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither, now get this, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no distinction between Jew and Gentile today. That is important. Do these religious people acknowledge that? To a point, but then they become inconsistent, as I will show you in just a few moments. And that's why... The book of Revelation is a breeding ground for all kinds of error. You've got people out there 
scared to death when they read the book of Revelation, folks, the things of Revelation have already happened. It was in highly symbolic language to bring comfort to the Christians in the first century. But if it fell into the hands of those people that are not Christians, they had no idea what it was talking about. But it did provide comfort to the Christians in the first century. It provides comfort for us in the sense, well, hey, no matter what happens in whatever country you live in on the face of this earth, not dealing just with the United States. The book of Revelation is not talking about the book of the, of the United States. The book of Revelation is talking about the battle between good and bad all over the face of this earth. And victory was accomplished through Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. But what you have is you have people still not getting the idea that there is no distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. They think there is. They think Jews today are still God's special people. Now, remember, when Jesus was on the face of this earth, before he died, he walked into Jerusalem. And in Matthew chapter 24, let's just look at the first part of this, when he says, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. He departed from the temple. Jesus still lived under the old law. Jesus hadn't died yet. We read that. Well, well a testator lives. Testament isn't enforced. It isn't until he dies that his testament becomes law. And so while Jesus was alive, he says, he departed from the temple and his disciples came to him and showed him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? And surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that's exactly what happened in uh, 70 AD. Rome came in and utterly destroyed the city. And what you have people thinking today, folks, this is it. In a nutshell, they're saying, you know what? The temple is going to be rebuilt. Why would the temple be rebuilt? Wasn't that what the book of Revelation is all about? You know, they're going to go back to Jerusalem. What does any of that have to do with the gospel? We're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Why would there be a temple built? That was that was under the old law. And when you think about the temple today, let's let's... What, what, was, what does the gospel say about the temple? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writing to brethren, okay, the church, the church at Corinth, he says in uh, chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, we'll pick it up in verse 16. Well, let's back up a little bit. Um, in verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer law, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Earlier in this chapter, he's talking about preaching the gospel and be careful how you do it. Make sure you stay with the truth. He says in verse 16, he's writing to the Christians there. And he says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? See, this is the gospel, folks. This is the gospel. And we have the temple. We are the temple of God because God dwells within us. Old Testament times, they would go to the temple. You know, that's the dwelling place of God. God's house. We've got Jesus upset with the money changers. Um, again, old, new. The old law has been done away with. We are under the gospel. There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. People need to get this. And people are thinking, there's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem? How does that even harmonize with the gospel? It makes no sense. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to save us from our sins. Who? All people, Jew and Gentile. He doesn't favor Jews today. He said, well, weren't those God's chosen people? Under the old law, he used the Jews to ultimately bring his son. But folks, under the Old Testament, a lot of those Jews were not faithful to God. The majority of them, and read, read Acts chapter 7, Stephen pointed out to them how that their forefathers had rejected the prophets and they killed the prophets. And you know what they did? They turned around and killed Stephen. They stoned him to death. Read that in Acts chapter 7. You see, people are reading through the Bible. They get the book of Revelation and they all of a sudden, they do a 180. Oh, we can't wait. You know, everybody's going back to Jerusalem and and uh, going to rebuild the temple and, and have that temple worship. That is in direct conflict 
to the gospel, folks. It doesn't even make any sense. But they're convincing people that it makes sense. And how do they do that? By ignoring other clear passages of Scripture that are found in the New Testament. It needs to harmonize, folks. God's not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm in 2 Corinthians now, the 6th chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It says in verse 16, Paul talking to the Christians again, he says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Who? The Christians. Christians. These are God's special people today. That's in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. I'm going to go ahead and read that. Those are the special ones. That's why we want people today to become Christians. Oh, people want to talk about prophecies, and they want to talk about how the, the, the book of Revelation is fulfilling all those prophecies and what's going to happen. The prophecies that they're talking about and the things that are going to happen contradict other clear passages of Scripture. And that's why when people want to go to the, the book of Revelation, a red flag needs to go off in your head because they're teaching things that contradict other clear passages of Scripture that we have been talking about throughout this. And so when we, when we think a little bit more along this, and, that, and this is what I'm wanting us to focus on, is that when we think about the gospel messages for all people, and that when people obey the gospel, remember, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why is that? Well, because if they respond to it, you know what they become? First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is he's describing his people. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but now are a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, now have obtained mercy. That goes for the Jew, the Gentile, the male or female, the, the bond or free. Everyone can become a part of that. And so to go ahead and teach a doctrine that elevates a certain race today, the Jews, and saying that God is, uh, Jesus is going to come back and, and he's going to rebuild the temple, that's Old Testament. That has nothing to do with the gospel. It contradicts it. And you can't have Old Testament and New Testament teaching at the same time. Now, I understand that in the New Testament, there were some things that were repeated from the Old Testament. I understand that. That makes perfect sense. Why? It makes perfect sense because my wife and I had wills that were updated. Why were they updated? Because our children are now grown, they're out of the house, and we now have grandchildren, so we updated them. But guess what? When we updated our will, we left some things the same. But when we die, they're not going to use an old will. They're going to use the most recent one. Yes, there's some things that were repeated, but because some things were repeated in our new will, they're, they're not going to say, well, that just opened up the floodgate now. Since you borrowed something from an older will, we're going to use everything from the old will. No, not at all. And that's what Paul had to deal with in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. He had to talk about marriage, and he had to mention in there the fact that um, if a man is married to two women at the same time, it's adultery. And he only introduced that because as you move on down, he's trying to let people know that you can take a hold of the gospel now because the old law has been done away with. Now, if both existed, you can't keep both. Old Testament, New Testament at the same time, it's spiritual adultery. So when you have Jesus coming and bringing the new law, that's what we are to abide by. Let me read a couple of passages here from the book of Acts. In Acts, the seventh chapter, again, this is where Jesus had gone back to heaven already, and I mentioned a little bit earlier about Stephen preaching. Well, this is, this is part of Stephen's sermon here in Acts chapter 7 and in verse 48. He well, look at verse 47. He, he says, but Solomon built him a house. Verse 48. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. 
Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will be built for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all things? You see, people want God to dwell in things that were made by the hand of man. Now, back in the Old Testament, you know, you had the temple and you had the holy place and you had the most holy place. But Jesus brought us a New Testament. He said the same thing in verse in, in Acts 17 and verse 24, that again, God's not going to dwell in a place where, where man's hands are. Now, he dwells with people. You know, people talk about the church. Again, this is all part of clearing up the misunderstanding. The church is not the building. The church are the people, the called out. The word church means the called out. If you drove by the Kirkwood, well, you would this morning uh, when we're assembled, but if you drove by there on a Monday, you couldn't say, well, there's the Kirkwood Church of Christ. No, that's the Kirkwood Church of Christ's building. That's not the Kirkwood Church. When the church, when you come together as a church, when the Christians come together as a church, you read that concept in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 and 18, when you come together as a church. Okay, so the church is not the building, it is the people. And Jesus provided him. The, the teaching that is necessary, this gospel. Remember Hebrews chapter uh, 1, verse 2, God has spoken unto us in these last days by his son. Paul said he spoke by revelation of Jesus Christ in, in Galatians chapter 1. So what you and I need to see is that this message that we have here, right here, is that we're talking about a gospel that is for everybody, and I'm not concerned with what's going on in different parts of the world right now. No, I, I worry about the wars that are going on. I'm concerned for all the souls of mankind. But when people talk about, well, this is a sign. This is a sign of what Revelation was talking about. People are talking about, they've been talking about signs ever since any major catastrophe took place. The world wars that took place, 9-11. Anytime there's something major takes place, people are saying, oh, this is a fulfillment of what you read in the book of Revelation. The things in Revelation already transpired. The only thing that's left is for Jesus to come back. And when Jesus comes back, it's called Judgment Day. It's called the end of time. And Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, 9, 10, 11, and 12, that at that time, it's Judgment Day. Everybody has left the earth, and the earth will be burned up. It will have served its purpose. And we'll go to heaven, we'll go to hell. after Judgment Day. And we need to be prepared for that. What you have is so many people misunderstanding what the book of Revelation is all about because they're taking terms and they fail to understand the spiritual application. The temple of God, we are it. Those who are faithful, God will dwell within those who are Christians and continue to because, you know, Christians can fall away. Well, obviously, God's not dwelling within them anymore. They're not following what the Lord has to say. We're trying to encourage people to follow what the Lord has to say and understand these distinctions. I can't stress enough what the first two lessons of our six-lesson home Bible study course deals with. Six lessons. Very quick to go through. But you know what's interesting? The first two lessons help us to understand just what we've been talking about. How that we have the Bible and how that we have the new law and how in, chat, in, in the second the second lesson gives us a little more distinction there, talking about the gospel. And I would encourage you folks to open up your Bibles, take this course, and study it. Don't be a man follower. Don't let people throw this unneeded fear within you. Um, this is the problem we have today. And people look at the book of Revelation and they, and they get scared. I want them to find comfort. The book of Revelation doesn't contradict the rest of the Bible. Matter of fact, it harmonizes. But you don't go there and contradict clear passages of Scripture that we talked about today. And there isn't going to be a rebuilding in Jerusalem. Now, the Bible says, well, what about in the book of Revelation? Talked about the new Jerusalem. He's talking about heaven. Symbolic terms, folks. You need to see that. That's where the harmony comes, play, comes into play. And we really want to encourage you to study. Open up your Bibles. Don't be a man follower. Just don't listen to what people have to say because they're saying it, because they come across like they're so knowledgeable. 
You'd be amazed at how much people don't know who claim to be religious leaders today because they're not rightly dividing the word of God. You can do that. Call the number and we'll leave your name and your address and we'll mail that first lesson out to you tomorrow morning. And you can begin your study of, of listening to what God has to say. That's what he wants us to do. Rightly divide it. People who are confused are being led astray. But you know what? They can't tell God. Well, he told me the wrong thing. Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, both fall in the ditch. Matthew 15 and verse 14. So if you tell God you believed, you know, somebody taught you a lie, but the fact is you believed a lie. The onus is on us. That's why Paul commended people in saying that they searched the scriptures daily to see whether the things he was saying were so. You and I need to search the scriptures. Would you like to have a face-to-face -face Bible study and talk about maybe even this subject and you have more questions and things you want to talk about? A lot of people ask me questions specifically about the book of Revelation, but when I take them over to these other passages to help them understand, you know, that you have the rest of the New Testament kind of sheds light on that. But just to stay in the book of Revelation and not look at it in light of all the Bible, you're going to find yourselves teaching things that are just not, not right. So we can have a face-to-face -face Bible study in the comfort of your home, at a coffee shop, or meet at the church building at a convenient time for, that you have. We'll study face-to-face. We're doing that throughout the week with a number of different folks. You can have your own class, join a class. If you're a lady, I'll bring my wife with me or somebody else. We'll make it as comfortable for you. Don't want it to be awkward. But we do want you to become familiar with the scriptures because that's what's going to judge us in the last day. That's why we need to study the word. Folks, would you like to be put on the mailing list for our weekly bulletin? Go ahead and suggest that when you enroll in the course and just say, when you mail that first lesson, please put me on the mailing list. And... As we've been offering every week, go, you can say, go ahead and pop in those two pamphlets, the 4030, 40 things that people are teaching that are in the Bible, but they're not. Some of the things that we were talking about right now, about the book of Revelation, people are saying, well, it's in the Bible, but it? no, they don't have any verses to back that up. And the 30 things that people are saying, Chuck, that's not in the Bible. Yeah, it is. And there are the verses that prove it. You need to look at that because people are being taught things that are just not right. And that's why we are told in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, test the spirits to see whether they're of God or not. I know it becomes easy just to let other people do the thinking for us. Well, they're religious leaders. Surely they're not going to lie to me. They, they have special knowledge. No, they don't. They have the same Bible you and I have. They have to read it like you and I do. And they have to rightly divide it like you and I have to. So the onus is on all of us. And I hope this lesson has stirred up some thinking, provoked you to think, and challenged you to study. And if we can be a help, let it be known. Folks, if you're ever in the Kirkwood area, please come by. We meet Sunday mornings at 9.30 for a Bible study, classes for all age groups, and then at 10.20 for worship, again in the afternoon at 5, and midweek Bible study at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. Again, bring the whole family. We have classes for all age groups. We'd love to have you get be our honored guest. Tune in next week. We're going to open up our Bibles together, and we will study the Word. Thank you.